Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Drawing Down the Stars. I'm your host, Snappy, and I'm joined today by Ryan Seven. How are you doing, Ryan? Hello, beautiful people. Welcome Hello, to Drawing Down the Stars. I'm your host. Again. I'll, I'll mute you. <laughs> yes, it's going fantastic, apart from the start of this live stream, which has uh, begun with a, a, a nice lubrication of sweat on my end from trying to get everything together. But we're here now. <laughs> Yeah, so it's midnight basically where you're at. So you had to be in a different room, and we had a little bit of a technical snafu, but things are good. So, so yeah, everyone... the, um, the camera kept falling over, so I put it on the floor so it can't fall over. <laughs> Perfect, wonderful. So Ryan, you're an occult researcher. You are a podcaster, and you do video essays, and you have a wonderful channel here called Ryan Seven. And you have all of this amazing content. I really enjoyed your kind of deep dives where you're traveling around the UK. You have some pretty well-produced videos, some great um, podcasts that you've done with some friends. Love the content. So what I want to know is how did you get into all of this kind of magical research and whatnot? And uh, you actually found my channel. How did you find my channel first? And you reached out to okay. me. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. I'll answer that second. Okay. Um, how did I get into all this? I think you get to a certain age, or if, if you have a certain kind of mind, that you start to question everything that you've been taught and everything you've been fed. And as I went down those rabbit holes, I kind of saw that there was trickery being used right at the base of statecraft, let's say. You know, just your general, the way that populaces are governed. I just saw a magic trickery there and so i was what the hell is this thing that they're doing to us can i distill all this down to an essence and as i started to look into it it had already been distilled into an essence it had <laughs> been alchemy it had been magic it had been all these other things and i quickly saw that what is stage magic as in distraction this is this is a bottle no it's not a bottle it's a piece of plastic because you're going to crush that in a minute in, in a second but you're going to you're gonna make us think it's a bottle. So when it's not a bottle, we, we've been tricked and right. misdirection and there are a million other tricks. And I just realized that none of these things were new and they went way back into the past, further back than we can probably look. And I wanted to learn them so that I wouldn't be deceived anymore. The fact that I learned, I call that bedarkenment. <laughs> Statecraft done in that way is bedarkenment. And what's the opposite of bedarkenment? Well, it's enlightenment. So as a process of learning the bedarkenment, I enlighten myself somewhat. <laughs> We're all in a process, aren't we? Yeah, right. There's always so much to uncover. And it feels like the more threads you pull loose, you find more nuance, more weirdness. You know, yeah. it gets gets the rabbit hole goes deeper and deeper all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. So um I then went on to learn hermetics and you know, the, the Saturnian religions and the I was particularly attracted to tarot due to having eaten some mushrooms and been shown them in a in a trip and saw them on my girlfriend's table and thought, what those silly cards? The, it was Crowley's Thoth deck. She had no idea of the history of it, but it was the Thoth deck. So I was like, well, come on, let's have a look at these cards then. And because I'm an artist, I saw the symbols and I was like, I recognize some of these symbols and what is all this? And this relates to all this magic stuff that I've been learning. And like, I just wanted to decode them. And that just led from one thing to another, to another. Eventually I ended up finding uh, some ruined pillars in a graveyard in, uh, in the hills in Northern England. And is that that Sator kind of video the you secrets did? of the universe? Excuse me. Was that the Sator video that you have on your yeah, channel? Yeah, the Sator square. Yeah. I'm currently making a, a longer Netflix version, but um, we're not going to start shooting again until Sunday. We postponed for Christmas and the cold. Okay. <laughs> Imagine it's pretty cold up there now, too. <laughs> Bloody freezing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so yeah. wild because, um, you know, that parallels really uh, closely to my discovery into this with both the pharaoh tarot and with uh, mm -hmm. mushrooms you know and this seems to be kind of an ongoing thread for a lot of people it's that symbolism and then something like drugs that kind of radically forces you to perceive symbols in a new light you know 
Well, I've heard you speak about India before and your travels in yeah. India. So was Taro your first touchstone? Was it the mushrooms? What, what, where do you begin, Snappy? So my story is like at a very young age, my, my mother was really kind of into a lot of like Celtic spirituality and kind of into intuitive stuff. My dad mm -hmm. was like a really hard atheist and right. like a hard materialist kind of person. But I was really deeply intrigued by the tarot from like a really young age, like we're talking seven or eight years old. And I kind of just got really invested in these different spiritual ideas. With me, I kind of I kind of got involved in evangelical Christianity at a young age because uh, there was like a youth group, yeah, in my school. And they, 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 it was one of these things where they loved bombed me because I read the Bible and I could recite it. So then they gave me all this praise and I made all these friends. And then I found myself just getting really wrapped up into that. And then had to, as I started to get older and started to discover myself, um, you know, a lot of it didn't work with me. And then I started to confront a lot of the, uh, you know, the ridiculous, the just the ridiculousness of the Bible itself and the way that the evangelicals approach that kind of stuff. So and, I was raised Roman Catholic, okay. not by my parents, but by local society. The good schools are Roman Catholic, so you're encouraged right. to be Roman Catholic. And certainly my grandparents were. And it was the same for me that, that drew me to the tarot too, because I'd always been like, what is this madness that you're all engaging in? What What is this hypocritical silliness that you're all Adam and Eve and real and I'm going home and David Attenborough is like, nah, mate, the, it's birds and bees time. You know what I'm saying? And so there was that disconnect while I was there that really helped me to want to understand what the what was going on with religion what's been going on with it and obviously right. there's the esoteric the 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 crowd control aspect of it the statecraft no also, i totally obviously, get that. The esoteric. Like, i started to recognize a lot of the you know being involved in the church community i felt very like immediately uh that kind of mechanisms of, of control especially as i started to mature and become like a young adult when they started guilting me about, you know, just life in general and trying to control me, trying to get me to become a priest. And this is kind of where my life was headed. And then mm. due to some kind of pretty awful things, I had like a harsh break. And then I was confronted with, I had all of this belief, but I had all of this extreme negativity. So as a young person, I didn't know what to do. And I got involved in university because I was I always did well in school. And I decided to study religion in, at university. And this is when everything started to just completely crumble. Because when you when you when you study this stuff academically, it all of the like, uh, you know, in evangelicalism, they really approach it as a literal kind of thing and that we have the one truth. And everyone kind of says that, you know, whether they're Hindu or they're Buddhist or what have you. And as you start to study these, like, especially how, like, I was really interested when I was doing religion studies in how texts unfold. And I became very interested in the colonial aspects of this kind of stuff and, and colonialism. Like, where I grew up, there was a massive Indian population and I had lots of Indian friends. And there was a uh, program studying colonialism and in India, in India specifically, and I got involved in that, and that's when I started so to read. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. sorry, being English, the yeah, okay. Well, and you know what? We're Canada is no better, and we're we're part of that whole kind of colonial project. You know, hey, we can sort out the the result of it, but I'm not guilty for the crimes of my no, forefathers. Exactly. No, but it's important that we we recognize what and you know it's the systems right it's always the like working class people are not are not to blame it's uh it's about understanding how these things unfold and how they utilize me mechanisms of control you know magic exactly mm. right and how they you know they wield text as an authority and what i was forced to confront in university is that there is no authority in any of these re religions right they're only ideas Mm -hmm. And I became really invested in trying to find the truth. I went to India and that was such a, 
a slap to the face. <laughs> I've been to India, yeah. In a more extreme <laughs> kind of way. Um, like I loved India, don't get me wrong, but I love the news, yeah. perception, you know, I was very young, right? I was like 18 when I went, uh, second year university, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I was just, I had this misconception in my head of what India was going to be like. And then it was all like, you know, I had this kind of hippy dippy approach to Hinduism. I thought it was better than what we were doing in the West. And then you get there and there's all these wild gurus and all of this insanity. I remember distinctly, there was this one, I'm studying with this one professor and they're telling me that there's nothing about drug use in Indian religion at all. And then immediately across the street, I can watch these sadhus just get in wrecked oh, yeah. <laughs> all day long. It's like, so, so something is amiss here. You guys are you're claiming you have the absolute answers, but no one really knows what's going on. You know? Yeah, not at all. And I, I think it's, it's okay for humans to scramble around for ideas, but just make sure you let everybody know that they're just ideas because then they right. can be challenged and confronted. And any systems that they provide the foundation of, we can pull them down by pu pulling out that piece of Jenga, as it were. No, that's exactly. not correct. Oh, it's all fine. No, well, good. The tower. Right. It's the tower. If right. What I started to tower. recognize, yeah, yeah. Like, it, you're exactly. What I started to recognize is that there are no absolute truths. And that pursuit of absolute truth in and of itself is kind of a lie, right? It's kind so of a what you just said, though. <laughs> You know, and also this idea that we can all have the same experiences, like a big thing in mm -hmm. Indian religions is, is you can achieve enlightenment like this guru or the Buddha or that Buddha or who, whoever. I don't believe that for one second anymore. You know, I believe like each of us has a unique perspective on life and our own life to live, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, so I, th I think a lot of the, the religions can take it too far as well. By, by necessity, a religion is uh, an incorporation of ideas, like an egregore, right. if you get me. Yeah. And uh, naturally, any system like that will have elements of it that want to take it further, take it further, take it further. And you keep going until you get to like extreme ascetism. Uh, and uh, you know, you know, like you're not a part of society anymore. You're no good to it. You're just living a selfish life now. Now, okay, if, if that's fine for you, that's fine. But I think most religions end up taking it too far at some point or another because they have that belief that it's real. Right, and you gotta, you gotta do, you gotta find that truth and pursue it. And what, like, what I confront, what I found in India was like the spiritual one-upmanship. You know, you have those gurus. If like I can bury myself alive. I can stand on one leg until my legs atrophy and rot away. And this is like somehow that, proof that one, I'm in one control. One guy with his arm above his head, have you seen him? Yeah. And his nails oh, are God. really long and he's, that's it. His arm's up there forever. Yeah, no, I saw, I saw many of those people. I was fortunate I got to be with one professor who took me to uh, Varanasi in India, which is like the holiest city. And he was studying with some of the more intense, they call them Naga Sadhus. And these are the guys who Snipes. live in like the mountains, you know. They're not the, the cannibalistic guys, but they're really, really intense. And, you know, I, one of these guys chased me, swearing at me with a whip. <laughs> like, what, but for your, for your good or because he was crazy? Or uh, both? <laughs> to try and, like, the they are rejecting society and they're trying to show their power and their rejection of society. Like a lot of it is a constructed image. What I really mm. got after like meeting a lot of these people is they want you to be their follower. They want you to invest in them, especially as a Westerner, they mm. see you as a, as a, as a, as a ticket to, to money, you know, mm. and I don't necessarily view this as a bad thing. Like I'm not trying to say it's all awful, but like I met several Westerners who would do a thing where they'd live in India for like six months until their visa ran out with their guru. Then they'd go back to the West, work for six months, come back, give all their money to their guru, you know? And he, this is great for the guru. The guru gets new teeth. He gets to sleep on a proper pod. No, it's seriously, like a lot of this stuff is really intense. Like people, like I didn't recognize, I didn't realize like in India, there's so much um homelessness and so many people are struggling and mm -hmm. becoming a religious monastic is a way to to have a, a genuine life you know mm -hmm. to 
and to be respected in society. And uh, a lot of people who are find themselves homeless or who are schizophrenic or what have you, they wind up falling into these religious roles out of necessity, you know, as a way yeah. to like, and this it's is the reality. Functional. All of that political stuff, like it's very easy when you're caught up in religion to to ignore the political and the material aspects of this kind of stuff, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, everything tends to, to be very functional. And one thing you do notice when you go in, to India is everything's very immediate. A lot of people are literally hand to mouth. Exactly. You know? So the, the what they want from you is immediate. It's very upfront. I like Indians, to be quite frank. Yeah, it is. Um, oh, yeah. It is a culture shock, culture bomb. But um, I really like India. I really like I Indians. Back in a heartbeat, I, I loved yeah. it, you know. But yeah. as a young man who had a, a very <laughs> different perspective on the world, it was like a, you know, it was a wake so up I call. Took, I took my mother for her fiftieth yeah. birthday quite a while ago. Now, uh, sorry, mum, and. I remember we got off the plane and we're in the coach to go to the hotel and just the look on her face, probably what you look like. <laughs> it just, it just drops it. I could, she wasn't quite prepared for it. She'd had this image of India in her head and, and obviously India is wanting to smash that image. Yeah. Right. Mm. And don't get me wrong. Like the people generally were amazing. And yeah. you know, once you understand how, like you said, people are living hand, you know, like they need you to give them money. And you start mm. to recognize like how far your money goes. Like, I remember at first I'd get so frustrated because people are constantly asking for money or you go to a restaurant and you get waited on by like 12 waiters <laughs> or at my flat, there'd be all these people who are like, you know, just working, doing menial tasks. One of the things that was a massive wake up call for me was uh, I had a washing machine and it broke down. And being like a Western Canadian, it's we have this very do it yourself kind of attitude. So I call the repair guy. They're going to come on Friday. I have a week. So I'm sitting there washing my clothes in my tub by myself. My friend Sartuk comes to visit me and he's looking at me. He's like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm washing my clothes. The washing machine's broke. He's like, you're in India. This is, this is offensive to me. And I'm like, what do you mean it's offensive? You're a rich person. You could go pay someone a, a quarter to do yeah, your own spread it. Yeah. And you have an obligate, like they have a very different idea. Like you have an obligation in India. If you have money and means to give people jobs, you know, mm. and that was really an important wake up call for me. So after that, I was like, oh, I was okay with people asking me, I didn't always give to everyone, but you know, like people you realized it. what it was. Yeah. yeah. It, the you wearing know? it on the front because it's so immediate. Yeah. Exactly. So snappy. You've talked about India. What about the mushrooms? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, I had been, you know, because I was got into religion young and I had kind of got really into this mysticism and I had really kind of removed myself from a lot of that stuff when like a lot of people go through it in their youth, you know, like I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs. So when I came back from India and I had kind of my whole world rocked, and I had tried, I basically just started to look into anything that religion was telling me was evil. Because I had this perspective that a lot of the stuff they said was evil and wrong was not evil or wrong in any sense. And I had been reading in academia a lot of the work of uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Ruck. And oh, yeah. learning about the, the prevalence of mushrooms and, and, you know, and I saw all the drug use in India. It's it's everywhere. And I did smoke Ooh. marijuana when I was there. And I had an incredible experience. So when I came back, I was like, okay, I got to try more stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in Canada, like we have, it's, it's, it's like, we had it, like mushrooms are on what's called like the gray market. They're not legal, but they're not illegal. You can't sell them. Mm. But you can't get persecuted if you have them. So there are right. all these like weird like stores that had opened up in my town where you can go and like purchase them for cash, you know? So one day I just went and I bought a bunch of mushrooms and they gave me, like I bought 14 grams and then I got like a free 3.5 gram bag. And, this is uh, yeah. 
like a golden yeah. teacher, just a very basic. And I took the 3.5 and it didn't really do anything to me. And I really wanted to have like a, uh, a mystical experience, you know, it just made me kind of wheezy, made me a bit giddy. So the next weekend I was like, F it. I locked myself in my room. I set my setting, you know, I, I went into Five meditation. Five dried grams in total darkness. Right. And I Sorry, did like, best time for I want to, I went, I was a bit stupid. I did the whole 14 grams, the whole ounce. <laughs> yeah. How, how it, are you down? <laughs> <laughs> it completely rocked my world. Like uh, what ended up happening to me is like the entire world came crashing down. I experienced over the course of eight hours, uh, basically my body be ripped apart to the infinitesimally small atoms. It became one with the universe. And then with a wave, all crashed back into one being. And this, mm. this whole experience synced up to my breathing in and out. And it went on for like eight hours straight, like crash, wave after wave after wave, and nothing I could do. And no one I could call because I didn't tell anyone. But it totally blew my mind open to things. And after that, I was just like, okay, there's something to a lot of this mysticism. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my meditation, everything was just worked a lot more easier after that. Mm. You know, I was able to... Like I could, I had been meditating for a long time and I would have some success, but after the mushrooms, I had like intense success. I started to be mm. able to, you know, get into these states of like out of body experience. And I started to recollect my dreams more and it just led me down this whole kind of mystical kind of pursuit. But my mysticism, I couch it in hard materialism. So uh, I don't believe like, that there's anything greater than the material world that we experience, but the material world is far more deep than we give it credit for at the same time. You know what I mean? I'm on exactly the same page. Yeah. It's like uh, a non-materialistic materialism. Exactly. Uh, right? You just don't know how far down the rabbit. I, th I think it's safe to say it's very interesting, but we've got no idea. Not really. We can see glimpses of it, but, You've got to be happy with the mystery of it. Right. Yeah. And I started so, to recognize... But, go ahead, sorry. No, I was, I was going to tell you about my mushroom experience, but if there's more yeah, to be yeah. told, Snappy, go for it. Oh, no. Uh, t you, you go ahead. I wanna, I'm want i excited to hear your trip. Okay. You so I had been... I'd, I'd always had a mystical bent when I was a child and often had out-of-body experiences but thought nothing of it. Um, I'd always been in touch with kind of the psychic knowing gnosis thing, but didn't pay too much creed. Mm -hmm. um, became a bit more scientific, studied physics, loved science. And then I was a musician. So I would, I'd, it was just strange coincidence. I'd been putting together mixes and I wanted somebody saying something profound. And I'd searched through the internet, found this guy that taught weird, Terence McKenna, and just put him saying something philosophical on this mix. And then about two weeks later, I was thinking about how, from a physics point of view, how sound seems to underlie the universe. And I had a very deep, I'd, I would say mystical feeling about it now. Back then, I didn't know. And... Um, I just so happened to then encounter Terence McKenna talking about how the shamans on ayahuasca can see the Icaros that they sing. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. Why not? Why not indulge? Why not have a little try and, and see if I can somehow get an edge in on this idea that I have that the universe is kind of constructed with sound? So I, I couldn't get ayahuasca. What I could get was mushrooms because I live in one of the best places in the entirety of Europe to go and find them. They were literally on the hills behind the house that I was in when I had the thought. So okay. I went out, <laughs> picked them, uh, psilocybe semi-lanciata, little liberty caps, and the Phrygian cap, as we would know. It. And right. um, when my nan had recently passed away, so I went down to her empty house and lied on her kitchen floor. Oh, I, I forgot to add one thing. I'd recently been very ill 
with what turned out to be uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis. I'm one of few people that get bad withdrawal from the Asterion, as you guys would oh, know. Yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. And it was awful. I hadn't eaten in about two months. My... Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I, I look really bad. Anything that went down came back up. So I'd been through the best cleansing you could ever possibly imagine. So I had a lot of these fresh Liberty Caps, which turned out to be very strong. And not your not what you had strong, but I had the same thing as you, Snappy. I had waves and waves. It's such a watery modality to it. Um, I remember a female voice coming to me right at the beginning saying, uh, sit down, relax. I was like, okay, female voice in my head. I'll sit down and relax. And then I'm rolling doobies to, to like kind of, because I'd never met anyone that had taken such a large amount. This is, you know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was nervous. And I'm like you, I'd not told anybody. I was on my own. So I'm rolling doobies just to pass the time. And I noticed that my hands were turning purple and that the, the room was now made up of matrix cubicles and that, when I looked at my hands, I looked like the Emperor from Star Wars. And I'm like, oh. And then the voice came back to me and said, if you don't close your eyes and go in, it'll happen on the outside and it'll be much more difficult. I'm like, okay, voice in my head. <laughs> I listened to you. <laughs> Went in and just this tidal wave of thoughts. And it was just like a tidal wave coming at me. And I just thought to myself, if I don't turn around and face this now, it's going to crush me under it. So I did, I turned around and faced it and that wave came over and it was like a, a trillion thoughts at once that you somehow remember, but you're not got the time to process. And then it went deeper and deeper and deeper and, and I got shown so many different things and understood things. And I ended up after about two hours beyond Saturn, as you and I would know it. I'd lost all sense of self. I was totally conscious. I came from a place that can only be described as total love and completion and oneness and came back to reality via a series of, and I would say, no, like the, the nodes on the tree of life. It was like, oh, there's a me. I've been here forever. Hang on. If there's a me, there's a that. And if there's a that, there's an over there. And I've got a positive and a negative, and it's like a masculine and feminine, and, and then yin and yang, and, and I'm coming back to reality, building the universe through dialectics, essentially. And then as I was coming back, as I'm literally getting up off the floor, I was shown Jesus, Buddha, you know, all these um, Viracocha, dudes I didn't even know the names of, but I was like, whoa, these man deities, like these man gods. I'm like, whoa, when I snapped out of it, like, I've just had the religious experience. Like, this wow. me, an anti believer, can't stand religion, really. Very interesting. But it's a bit yeah, dodgy, isn't it? System of control, yeah. yeah. Not for yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I stood up, I was, oh, I've just had the religious experience. That was profoundly beautiful. And I've turned around, and in front of me, in the middle of the room, is a perfect geometrical representation of, well, the the male voice now that told me it was Solomon's temple and I've got to build it. I didn't know anything about the Masons myth or anything like that. It, it looked like a series of pyramids mixed between like Egypt and the Aztec kind of thing. And it's all lines, you know, like a, a wireframe computer model. And it's spinning perfectly in the room. I've turned away and gone, oh, my fucking, so excuse me, oh, my flipping heck, I've had too much <laughs> this time. And then I turned back, and, and it had moved the exact amount that it would move if it was real. And then, yeah, and then essentially what sounded like God's voice said, uh, it's Solomon's temple, you're going to have to build that. I'm like, okay. And then I picked up the phone and talked to my friend because it was just too much for me to handle at that point. So, yeah. And then, as I'd said before, that changed me entirely. I'd, I'd had the predilection for all this stuff, Snappy, but that'll do it to you. <laughs> right. No, when you're confronted with, yeah, seeing the Temple of Solomon and seeing man gods, like, wow, shattered yeah. your reality, right? And yeah. you have your, your preconceptions. Like, that's, that's powerful stuff. But I still relate, you know, I'm also a musician. 
And after I had come back from India, I kind of quit religion studies and got, dove into being a musician for a long time and was heavily involved in kind of like, you know, I had basically kind of abandoned a lot of religious studies in general for a long time. But this stuff kept coming back, kept coming back. And um, I tried to like live a more regular life, but <laughs> it just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. happening for me. Um, I wound up, eventually I wound up founding this more kind of Saturnian kind of magic and getting really interested because I always had this, or after I got back from India, I had this strong idea of pursuing a lot of this more negative stuff or stuff that I was against you know, like pagan ideas um, and like mysticism and just diving into a lot of that. And at one point I did another mushroom trip and it's kind of very similar to yours, but this time I, uh, I want to, I just, I basically, I met like now, if I was going to use mythological terms, I wound up meeting Dionysus and, cool. uh, or I became Dionysus. It's, I basically, I found, I'm sitting on my bed kind of in meditating and then the bed becomes the blackness of space and I'm floating in space. And then I find myself as the, the divine hermaphrodite at the beginning of time. And I'm stuck there for an infinity, like yep. alone, yep. alone. And I'm just so angry about being alone. I eventually rip myself apart into two i, I was two. bored snappy you said you were angry i i got bored i was like it's beautiful here it's a bit boring though is i want to do something so it's yeah. interesting that you can still be yourself while you're there that that your right. personality somehow reaches through even beyond your own ego because that's already gone yeah it's mostly. so interesting no it's it's, mm. it's wild to think about you know so i wound up splitting myself in two <laughs> into like a male and a female and then i started having an argument with myself over who was going to be the bottom because <laughs> we were gonna, i'm gonna fuck myself well, you know. <laughs> and it's like this infinite fight between these two sides of, of myself going on and then eventually wow. that broke down and i wound up meeting dionysus and he's laughing at me and he tells me that I'm, I'm like, so what's the point of it all? And he just starts laughing. He says, it's all a joke. I'm like, what do you mean it's all a joke? And he goes, you got to find the passwords. And I'm like, what do you mean you got to find the password? And he starts beating a drum. And then he says, open sesame. <laughs> and, <disappears. laughs> and that wow. was like the most intense vision I've ever had on mushrooms. I've never had another vision like that. But, was uh, was Dionysus at that point? Was Dionysus to you the hermaphrodite, or what? Was he a, a high of? Was he you two back together, reformed, cleaned out? Well, at what, that what, point, like I had descended kind of into the material universe and reformed the entire universe, and I was back to being myself. Like I'm starting to come back to normal, yeah. and then Dionysus shows up sitting on my bed, and I. I Go I ahead, figure that Dionysus is quite earthly, isn't it? He's like Fanny's yeah. or he's, he's kind of that primary, primal energy mirrored down here. It, would you see it that way? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You know, I, I, I think that Fanny's is the equivalent of the Indian Shiva and that mm. they are, you know, basically Fanny's is the universal world soul, right? The first of creation in my conception, I believe that there's the there's the chaos, the divine kind of mother, which exists mm. outside of time and space, yeah. that gives mm. birth to creation. And yeah. Dionysus Phanes is that creation, right? right? And then they commit the first sacrifice. They rip themselves apart and they mm -hmm. descend into the material. Yeah. And the the, the mother kind of pushes this evolution of forms and the idea is eventually to return back to that one in this ever unfolding cycle. At least that's how it was revealed to me. And this kind yeah, of, I mean, and then, yeah, that, I'm getting that as well. Yeah. I, I can and cut, I read, yeah. And the more I read, I find this being, you know, like if you read the Orphic cosmogony or, or you read about the myths of Addis and Sibylde, you see mm -hmm. the same things or like yeah. I was talking about, like in school, when I was studying Indian religions, you see this within the Shaivite and Shakti traditions. 
mm-hmm. you know, and that's the goal of the of the of the of the shaman or the yogi to kind of become that divine hermaphrodite to reform yeah. the yeah. universe into the self, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what Dionysus was telling me I needed to do. And to do this, I had to go and find these passwords. I have to go and find something, you know. So for a long time after this, you know, after this experience, I was like trying to find anyone who could talk to me about this kind of Saturnian stuff. And in my experience, most people, especially with the Saturnian in the in the Dionysian, they're completely full of it you know, or they're very much into fascism and conspiracy and a lot of Mm -hmm. like really, really dark stuff, which is not what I was seeing in like the authentic Greek texts. And what happened with me is I was still, the the one person who was making the most sense was was Dr. Carl Ruck. Mm -hmm. And I was absorbing everything I could get my hands on by Ruck. And I came across this podcast called The Sacred Speaks that they were on. And I watched an interview with him and this guy, Dr. John Price, talking about the psychology of this, becoming this shaman and all all this stuff. But the next interview was with this guy, Dr. Amon Hillman. Hey. (laughs) I don't know if you follow Lady Babylon at all. or if you're As I have with Drawing Down the Stars, I've watched every episode pretty much from the beginning. But I'll tell you this story in a moment. Yeah. So I wound up meeting Ammon. And what was wild to me is like for years now, I've been recording my dreams, you know, and a lot of them are vague, but every once in a while, there's a very clear one. And and for years, I'd had this dream of this ghostly figure that would be over top of me in my bed. And it would be like a sleep paralysis. I could, could never tell if it was sleep paralysis or if it was a literal dream, but I would mm. be stuck with this ghostly figure over top of me. And then at one point in the dream, they would, they'd take their hood off and they'd have a bald head covered in tattoos. <laughs> and then I really? saw Adam with the tattoos. So I was like, holy shit. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, you know, but. No, uh, that's like, okay. So now let me make that yeah. sound less ridiculous. So I had, I still have been writing a book before I had the, the opportunity to make this Netflix documentary thing. So I've abandoned the book for now. However, during writing the book, I had come across the conundrum of Ganymede and Zeus and the rape of Ganymede and the fact that he's the cupbearer. And I followed it to so far, and I was like, there's something going on with Ganymede's bum hole here and his penis. And as you guys seem to indulge in the texts, because I'm an, an artist, I have this predilection for being able to decode symbols in the visual context. And when I'm looking at the works by the masters, I am definitely seeing things going Ganymede's bottom, often arrows. Right. Now, I, I couldn't figure this out. I, I, was, I was scratching at it, but I couldn't figure it out. So that night I went to bed. I normally have a little go at remote viewing. You know what remote viewing is? Yeah. Uh, remote viewing for everybody out there that doesn't know, it's basically switching your brain off, grabbing at the ether to find answers to things, you know, questions you might have or you want to know where an object is or something like that. Go and look into it. It's very interesting. CIA had a lot to do with it. Anyway, so I'd done my little remote viewing practice and I was just nodding off. And I still had in my mind, like, what's going on with Ganymede here? It's really getting to me now. It's stopping me writing the book. So I'm nodding off in bed and an African chief came to me, <laughs> an African chief, headdress, everything. And he, he, he said a word to me. He said, Nematon. I'm like, Nematon. And then I fell asleep, woke up the day after. And I was like, that was very strange. Why? It's only Greek. So I'm looking it up and it, it turns out it's a word for a sacred grove. And you and Dion had just done the Sacred Grove episode. So I'm watching that. I'm like, hang on a minute. This is totally related to the Ganymede thing. This African chap <laughs> chap's told me something good here. And then from you, I've bounced over to Amon, who's literally going on about the stuff with Ganymede. So after that, I was hooked. Uh, there was a little bit of catch-up to be done. So I wasn't often tuning in for the live stuff. But, um, yeah, just seeing you guys crack at it is, it was 
totally. It just that that I would never have bridged that gap without you lot because I don't read Greek. Yeah, and you know our culture, we've become so far removed from a lot of this. You know, partially for good reason, but we've put such a taboo upon a lot of the sex, drugs, and especially children. That mm. and then you know the the religions these these mystical cults have become like Christianity has become this central driving force of our of our Western culture. That it's impossible to see these images anymore. You know, they've been they become yeah. they become obscured. You know, mm. and so yeah. it really needs someone like an, a Dr. Amon. Who's who's going to that Orphic Vox and yeah. is, is going to those dark places and <laughs> without, without taboo, you know? So yeah. It's it's like um, you know, I'm not endorsing any of the crazy, insane stuff the ancients did, but we have no. to be honest about what was going on, you know. Absolutely. And sometimes I think I'm on my though. I think he'd be, he'd be <laughs> reverent in it sometimes. I love that guy though. Top guy. I mean, it, it takes a pair of balls to uh to go out and start saying this stuff and to attack it in the way that he has, I've got I've got to admire the man. I snappy. I almost came on with a shower cap, uh, with some things marked onto the side of my head, but I just didn't have enough time. Very <laughs> nearly did it. That's hilarious. But you know, Ammon is such a. He wound up becoming a really good friend. Like I wound up, I yeah, reached I out so. to him. It was kind of wild. Like um, you know, when I saw him, it freaked me so much out because it con conformed with my dream. And then he was mm. talking about all the stuff I had been researching for years on my own and no one else was talking about it. And he was saying the key things because like, in my perspective, what I was seeing with Saturn is that Saturn was castrated, brought low to the underworld and transformed into a woman, right? And then is reborn as that Medea. Yeah, reborn, yeah. Right? Is reborn as this Lady Babylon type figure to come and flip yeah. the poles. And you see this kind of interchange and it's not where... You know, Zeus was Urano, where, you know, you have like Uranos to Zeus to Athena, you know, yeah. and like there's this, there's this constant cycle of change and of death and rebirth. Mm. And, and there's this connection between the male and the female. So many people, when they were talking about Saturn, were reducing it to this angry old masculine, you know, mm. and only that. I'm not saying that that isn't there. That's clearly there. But yeah. I don't think that's the totality. That's not the totality of that image. Not in the Greek conception. Not in in the real conception. In, I mean, I, th I think because these are a metaphysic, that you just need to consider it to reveal what it's about. And no, it's not just about limitation. Is what you're talking about essentially, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's very important. It's probably his most important feature. He his her because it's like that. Being if you um, follow Kabbalah at all. You know, it's it, Saturn's Bina, which is the, the divine feminine. It's it's a very strange at onceness to Saturn, I find. And it's that limiting factor. Right. And I, the end. in my in my mystical approach, like I'm a percussionist and I got re I'm really into drumming and I would have these out of body experiences while drumming, entering into these flow states. And I would perceive the goddess as as Rhea, which is Saturn's his feminine wife, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, his wife, you know, yeah. and it, I just really deeply connected to this thing. So when Ammon started talking about this stuff, the only person I heard ever talk about this, I was like, holy crap. And I started watching all of the videos he did with Neil. This was before he started his own channel. Mm -hmm. And when he started his own channel, I was right there at the beginning. And he started talking about how you got to take this into your own hands. You have to go through an initiation. You have to, you know, and he brought up, there's this amazing text about um, uh, the goddess Sibylle or Rhea, but it, it's called the Syrian goddess by Lucy. Mm -hmm. And yep. he talks about going to Babylon and seeing what he calls the Biblian Aphrodite, but we would know her as, as Sibylle or as Astarte. And he talks about how all of the people, if you wanted to be initiated into this rite, you have to go through this mourning for the death of Adonis. Mm. And he would talk, he would equate Adonis Ammon with, with Zeus and talk about the, the prophecies of the uh, 
Sibylline oracles. So all of these things are lining up for me. Oh, like I was into Sibylle and Rhea and he's talking about, you know, just mm. started to blow my mind. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to, I got to shave my head. <laughs> I got to dive right in, you know? So I shaved my head and then I reached out to Ammon and I talked to him about how my research years ago into Shiva I had discovered, like, in my perspective, that Shiva and Dionysus were the same person. Yeah, same thing, yeah. And when I showed him the research I had done, he was just like, holy crap. And he invited me, like, unprompted onto his street. And uh, we just become really good friends after that. And I just Sweet. started messaging him and asking him all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, and he's just been... He's an interesting guy. He's he's not like a guru in any means. All he does is he'll feed me texts. I'll ask him a question, and he'll be like, "Oh, read this." <laughs> I, th I think I think he's a little guru, like in that he loves the trickster way yes. of teaching. No, I I I, I love that. So try to. I'm all, although he can be Lady Babylon can be a bit of a slog to get through. Yeah, it's intense. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, although know, during that, I, I have learned to read Greek. Oh wow! I can't. I don't know what the words mean, but I've you know I can read it now. You're picking it up, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I started to study a bit of the Greek with Ammon, and I intend to wind up in the future. He's getting his academy going right now, called Omni. Can, can you tell me about that? I've I've, I've kind of missed. I, I saw that last episode when you talk. You talking? I forgot what it's called. But um, <laughs> what what's 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 going on with all that? So. The whole, you know, Ammon, he's very, he doesn't tell anyone anything 100% what's going on. So I can only talk to you about the stuff that he's revealed to me. And yeah. I'm talking with like 10% knowledge yeah. here, you know, and what his, uh, what Chewy has told me about. And basically, as far as I understand, um, he was doing these videos and a, a rich benefactor saw the videos and really identified like it's interesting that you brought up the building of the temple of solomon because mm -hmm. this is kind of what amen is after his main goal he wants to construct the temple of the muses museum yeah you know to rebuild the museum and he equates this there's this really amazing text i always tell everyone to read it's called uh, the hymn to the mother of gods by julian the uh, philosopher or the apostate emperor julian and um this text, type that in. <laughs> yeah, it re it retells two stories at the same time, or a bunch of different stories. But he talks about the fall, of these cyclical falls of empires. So he talks about the fall of the Greek Empire of Alexander and the destruction of Athens, and he brings up Julian how the uh, oracle at Delphi said, "If you persecute." the maenads, the followers of Dionysus, if you persecute the transgendered followers of the god Attis in Sibylle, your society is going to be destroyed. And if you go after the women, you're going to be destroyed. And the Athenians, they do that. But the oracle also gives a way out. She says, if you build the museum, the foundation, your culture will persist. And you, even though you'll go through a dark age, not everything will be lost. It will revive itself again. So he tells about the destruction of Athens, but then he talks about how hundreds of years later, the Romans decide that they need to go to the Oracle at Delphi because they're at war with Carthage and they're losing. They're losing badly and they're terrified that the Republic is going to fall. And the oracle at Delphi, she tells them, you need to build the museum. And to do this, you need to go to Syria and you need to take the Eidolon, the idol of Sibylle, bring it to Rome and install it at the, um, the Saturnine Hill, you know? And um, they do that. They go to Pergamum in Turkey, sorry, not Syria, in Turkey. They get the they get the idol, they bring it back, and he tells all this mystical story about them bringing back the idol and installing it. And then this is where the entire kind of Roman Empire starts, basically. Once they bring the idol, Julian mm -hmm. equates it to the golden age of Rome. And uh, they adopt Greek religion and Greek culture, 
even more fully than they ever had. Yeah. And he kind of sees this as this this necessity. And then he all and he also talks about like this the metaphysical story of Attis and Sibylle, which is Attis is is this masculine god who um is kind of bound down to the earth. They're engaged in like really frivolous sexual behavior with the nymphs, and they're they're hating their life. And the goddess reveals herself to him and says, climb the holy mountain, right? Mm. And give up this, this love of, of the material, basically, the nymphs. So Addis castrates themselves and engages in this form of divine imitation, takes up the drum, and through the music of the drum and through this divine imitation, is able to become Sibylle. Is that you know, your password, was, Snappy? Was the drum your password? The shaman's horse? Exactly. Yes. Beautiful. All connects, right? Just freaking really wild. Does. Yeah. And do you find the drum really works for you? Really works for me. And, you know, I kept seeing myself in these stories that Ammon was feeding me. And he kind of knew where I was coming from at that time. And it, it just blew my mind. And I recognized that what I needed to do, and I've started to go down this mystical path. But this whole story of building the museum. It, mm. to me, it really connects with our cycles here because we can see the same. So Julian warns about the Christians. He warns that the Christians are doing the same thing that the Athenians did. They're persecuting the women and the, the trans followers of Sibylle. They're vilifying these, these people. And if they do that, that Rome is going to be destroyed. So he engages in this war against the Christians and uh, he ultimately dies for it, um, Emperor Julian. And if we look at the history, it, it, it all plays out, right? Rome winds up falling. It enters into a dark age, you know? And we get this extreme um, stagnation of the Catholic Church in the, in the Byzantian Church, you know? And how does that end? It ends when the Greek culture comes back in, yes, the, Renaissance. in the Renaissance. Yeah. And, and tarot pops up at that time. And it it's comes exactly to us from where, though? It comes to us from Turkey during the Islamic Golden Age when mm. they translate all these texts it's from Greek, that yeah. original museum that was in Turkey. Blew my mind. And I'm like, in, in my perspective, you know, I'm getting mystical here, so take it as yeah. you will. But Go for it. We're, entering, we're entering a similar cycle again. You know, we're seeing the powers that be persecute trans and queer people and women again. We're seeing the rise of this ultra strict Christianity, you know? And we're also though, at the same time, seeing this through the internet, a renaissance of the Greek, you know? Mm. So I believe that we're entering into this, this time again of this flipping of the poles of destruction and rebirth. So you know? to go um, mystical and that we are entering, entering into the age of Aquarius, and that Aquarius is kind of the gay, trans, you know, hermaphrodite of the zodiac, if there were to be any. Right. Do you ever feel, I, I often think, well, it, perhaps these big, large, zodiacal ideas of cycles are actually true. It does feel like, if you look at the past history, very Piscean, very I believe, I don't believe. We're going into kind of an I, I know era, and that, you know, the, the, as you were saying, the, the, the differences between all the genders, that's being all brought up again and everything's going a bit crazy with it. It does feel like we're entering into like the, uh, the, that kind of, to stay astrological, there's that kind of Mars power powering this sudden burst into the beginning of Aquarius that takes that, that, um, that bit of energy it takes to get the car started, for example. You know, it's a sudden burst of, of high frequency energy before everything then settles down again into a new modality. And I, I wonder if you have a take on that. Because I certainly I feel that way. I, I, I fully agree. Fully. So the cycles was really like from the beginning, that's what really um spoke to me about paganism. And that's really the central mythology that brought me here. And this was before ever meeting Ammon. And it's mm -hmm. only intensified since since studying with him. And what I see is just like you were saying, you know, um, there's always this kind of flipping of the poles. If you look at the previous golden age of Saturn, 
right? It was this time of freedom and of mysticism and of equality. And, and laziness, Stuffy. We're all lazy. No one did anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it was, it was a, like, you know, I, I mean, I have a very romantic view of the Bronze Age, you know, so take that as it is. But I look at a lot of the, the those indigenous cultures and I see a lot of beauty, a lot of profound creativity mm. there. It's not technological, but they have this incredible mysticism and connection to the dream yeah. world, to the dream time, to the natural flow. It, in my perspective, it was kind of a golden age because people were free to be themselves, you know, but... At the same time, there was all of this death and, and, and pain. Yeah, and nature. Yeah, you know? na nature's still there. Nature's bloody in tooth and claw waiting at your door every day. Hence, Christmas, you know, where you live, it's yeah. cold. Where I live, it's cold. And there's a, there's a very good reason why we celebrate Christmas, because it's really cold. Grandma just died. We're all very lucky to have survived all this. Let's celebrate the return of the sun. Yeah. But, you know, so I saw that that kind of cycle running its course with Saturn. And mm. I believe like the Saturnian element turned kind of corrosive. It didn't want to grow. It didn't want to transform, you know, society stopped transforming. So then there had to be kind of an apocalyptic upset. And this is what we call like the death of Saturn where Saturn is castrated, brought low and transformed. And then we enter into the era of Zeus, which is this patriarchal era. Oh, and it's, mm. it's, it's, well, you know, it's it's hard for, for me, especially looking at where we're at now to see the goodness of this, but it's brought all this incredible technological advancement. It's brought this incredible, like we can talk, right? It's, yeah. it's trans And I believe like this was a necessary evolutionary form. But what we're starting to see now with this patriarchal form is that, you know, if we look at this idea of consuming the children that we see with Saturn, you're seeing mm -hmm. the same thing happen now with this patriarchal God that's yeah. destroying any other type of idea because he's corrupt because he's selfish because he wants to be the sole god if we're talking right? saturn well if you're talking zeus it's zeus. the same thing right yeah. well it's, it's it's running the same course it's that that Every force time, yeah. is now like um nietzsche is a really good person to understand this because he talks about you have the apollonian and the dionysian, dionysian and the saturnian yeah. you know so Things are born in this Dionysian frenzy where you have this freedom and love, but then they, they, they kind of become Apollonian where you get the height of culture, but it starts to calcify and become codified and it starts to, it doesn't want to give up its, its control. And then it turns into that Saturnian energy and that well, energy needs to be overthrown, you know? To, um, obviously we don't look at Plato in, in the way a lot of Westerners do. Yeah. But, um, you know, he he had it right when uh, soft men make difficult times, difficult times make hard men, hard men make, you know, and th that cycle goes round. I mean, we've seen it within our lifetime, lifetimes, have we not? Things have accelerated yeah. so much. You can see you can see that cycle within two or three generations now. Right. And, you know, this is something that I, I, I mean, a lot of people get scared about, but I see us entering into another type of apocalypse moment where, yeah. you know, um, our society, those who, those who control us, right? Like as much as a control can be, I don't think like, I'm not one of these conspiracists. I don't believe that there's, there's anyone in total control, but they're in enough control that they could prevent us from transforming from, from God. We need, we've, we've come to this point where we're so removed from the natural world and we are stuck in such hubris that we're going to destroy the environment make it untenable for us to survive and we're gonna we could potentially lose out as a species i don't think that life will stop but the question no. is will humanity persist as it is or will it be forcibly evolved into something else you know i th i think that's for sure i think that's for sure we'll do it to ourselves but we will force ourselves to evolve as well right. and i i see humanity We've become very polarized of recency, have we not? The, especially yeah. in the West, yeah. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. It, it'll break apart and reform. It'll break apart. It always does this. And that. It's like little boys and little girls. Girls are horrible. Uh, boys smell, you know what I mean? And then that's so that when you become 
young teenagers, you go, oh, girls, they're interesting. Oh, boys, they're interesting. And then they come back together again. And then you do realize that boys are horrible and girls do smell. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me when we look to at this, these myth of the cycles. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they think all of the myths happened in the past. But I believe, like, and if you read, like, uh, some of these philosophers, like Anaximander or Heraclitus, the, the myths are forever unfolding, you know? Mm. So I look at something like the story of Athena, and I see that as yet to have come. And if we look at that particular story, Zeus goes through the same process of tyranny as Saturn did, as Kronos yeah. did. He starts to consume his children. He eats his wife, Metis, his feminine side, to prevent the birth of Athena. But it doesn't prevent the birth of Athena. Instead, Zeus is forcibly transformed into Athena <laughs> through the process of reason. And then Athena is this divine gynomorph, where she's both male and female, but presents as a woman, you know? And I see can, that's can I... where our society is going. We have to transform ourselves through this faculty of reason and unite the male and the female. Yes. I'd like to point to a symbology there in that axe. Now, a lot of the time when I'm coming around axe symbology, it's pole star stuff. Right. They're pointing at the pole. And that a lot of mysticism, including in the tarot, as I believe, or as I've discovered, they're, they're obsessed with the two poles, like the uh, World Universe card. That, the lady at the end holds two poles. Right. And I think that just keeps showing itself. And I've got to say, most axes in those days uh, of the ceremonial kind were double-headed. So I see a mushroom in that, a mushroom in the pole. Also, with um, we were talking about you, you know, the castration of, of Uranus and, and Saturn and everybody else. Well, you, Uranus's um, penis forms into it; it becomes bloody and frothy with the with the sperm, and obviously there's becomes lots going on Aphrodite. in that, and becomes Aphrodite, which means form of the sea. Now, I don't know if you read it, but you put something about um, Venus Aphrodite the other day. And I mentioned that if you turn the famous birth of Ap Aphrodite upside down, that clamshell suddenly becomes the head of a mushroom. And that um, God now Wasson, who I'm sure you're familiar with it if you've studied all this. He uh, noted that the etymology of mushroom is mousse eron, which is foam of the sea, because the ancients saw anything mossy, moussey, as we would say in England, squidgy, slimy, um, was from the sea. So mushrooms were born of the foam of the sea, as was Venus Urania, Venus Aphrodite, whatever you want to call her. So yeah. I'm not firm about that, but there's, there are many mushroom links in this. And not forgetting, penises look like mushrooms. Right. Well, this is also like going back to my my vision. When I, when I talked to Dionysus, he told me two pass, well, three passwords, open sesame, the drum and the mushroom and then he told me to find the other ones but you know so i think like the mushrooms the drugs are a key to being able to perceive things outside of time to see the symbols yeah. for what they are the mm -hmm. mushrooms are kind of like this divine communication it's like that that hermes energy you know and um like his hat but, right his hat. That... if you look at hermes trismegistus his hat is literally a liberty cat mushroom Right. It's all there. And I think it's also really important we, we, we look at the when we look at the goddess Rhea Sibylle, she's said to be the power behind the throne. Mm -hmm. She's the one who flips the pole. Okay. Yeah. She she's the one who orchestrates the death of Uranos and then orchestrates the death of Kronos and then Will with Zeus as well, you know. In, in the Latin, she's called ops, which means right. work. So she's literally, where Saturn's like making you work, ops is the work. Right. I so see her as that. Hard, isn't it? She's that unfolding of time. She ensures, she ensures that things continue to evolve and persist, mm -hmm. you know? And in, no matter what happens, life is going to persist. The question is, do we manage to survive? You know, and that's what I think like the building of the museum is about. And mm. if you look at someone like Asimov, like I love connecting this to science fiction. 
um, Asimov wrote a series of books called The Foundation. And yeah, he he's right on to everything. And if you look at the very end of Foundation, what happens? Humanity merges with all of life to create a goddess that is both individual and, you know, everyone is connected called Galaxia. Well, mm -hmm. the Galaxia, if you look at that word, this was the feast that they would have at the Temple of the Muses, where everyone would come together and get to eat. Well, and were united in feasting. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's happy. I mean, if we're all having these similar visions and we're all of a similar quest, you know, perhaps Ammon's Museum might be the forum to to have that done. I exactly. mean, as you said, it's it's always these things are always very, 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 very personal, but also they are there are notes of these personal symphonies that are shared with everybody. You know, yeah. we're all humans. You all yourself. We're all individuals. We're all part of the group. We're all masculine. We're all feminine. You know, and I think working working at those things, you need to work on them. You know, obviously, I have a beard. I'm going towards the masculine often. I'm a martial artist, for example. And I, I, I see the interplay of, of feminine and masculine in the energy so quickly and readily from doing the martial arts. Somebody's trying to hit me in the face. Well, I'm going to be feminine in a moment. So I better enter the feminine and, and guard myself. And, you know. Well, what I see is that so much of the ancient, like, rites were about this. Ex if you look at, like, the rites of Dionysus specifically, you were meant to enter into a state of panic where you perceive the all, the pan. You become mm. one with the universe. So when you go through these rites, it doesn't matter what your gender is. You become all genders. Yeah. You, know, you become animal. You become male and female. I and mean, I think it's got to be said in, in those mind states, gender's the first thing that, that goes. You are not at all concerned about what's between your legs, even a little bit. Not right. quite quickly too. Probably on the first bite, you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> and, you know, I honestly, I believe that like these rigid dichotomies that we've created, you know, there are people who are very masculine and there are people who are very feminine, but these rigid dichotomies that we have created in our society are largely false, you know, yeah. and people are ever in a state of flux and it's, mm. it's ridiculous to, to, to be so bound by them. And the point of life is to experience the That's unfolding cool. of life. You got to you got to experience the all, right? And I don't yeah. just mean gender. I mean also the animal, the plant, the material, right? And something like the the rituals, magic and drugs can allow you to engage with that where like you don't have to be trans. You can you can do it by proxy. You know, you don't you don't have to go through a physical transformation. You can do you just it hold in your down. Mind hunt down the metaphysical feminine and engage with it. That's it. Right. It might be spending, as a man, it might be spending more time with your mother. Yeah. It might be as simple as that. You know, right. I'm an artist. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have quite a masculine bent, but I'm also a dancer, an artist, a musician, you know? Exactly. Big girls blow sometimes. <laughs> well, we all have to learn to, to communicate and understand and experience the other. And, the perceiving of the other transforms you, right? Like something that Ammon talks about a lot that really hit with me is this idea of monism. This absolute monism is a, is, is a problem. When you reduce everything to a masculine singularity and everything mm. is an absolute and individual truth, you get rid of all of communication and you force people to conform and to reduce themselves to an ideal, an unachievable Stop. ideal. I think you know? that was no, don't you? I think that I think that the yeah. you know these patriarchal religions went. Hmm, if we get rid of the feminine, get get take those Asherah poles down, and uh, and we can take over more easily because we've got rid of the chaos element, and all we have left is the the order. Look, and I, it's also I, about I politics and power. Sorry, what was this gonna say? It's also about politics and power. You know, when you take young men and you reduce them into this absolute strict authority and you, you wind them up, you deny them sex and drugs, you can then sick them on other people. If we mm -hmm. look at what happens, what, like, if we look at the history of Christianity, what happens when it becomes incorporated and becomes an official Roman religion? It gets weaponized as a tool for genocide and colonialism. Yeah. You know? And they use it to just destroy and to take and to power those people at the top. 
And that's largely what religion has become, which is so depressing because these rites that are at the heart of these, of these cults, which inspired them initially, were about this experience of the other, about this embracing of life, this affirmation of, of the world. And we've turned it into this death cult, which is like terrified. You know, one thing I always like to focus on is if we listen, like when I was in evangelical Christianity, the goal that was to bring about heaven on earth, an absolute hierarchy where God exists as a physical being, Jesus, and rules over everyone. And all we do is worship and praise for all eternity in an unchanging stagnation. Like when you really think about that, that is as evil and as horrible as it could possibly get. That is my definition of hell, you know? Yeah. I, I must say, though, to just to counteract that slightly, Snappy, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I see it, religion would have been at one point, camp, I'll, I'll call it just, just to be parochial, uh, campfire shamanism. You know, the early tribes, you, you'd have your one guy that through these same rites that we're talking about, uh, although unformed at the time, would have given him insight or her insight into things that the rest of the tribe don't know. Maybe they're just naturally more intelligent. Maybe they are starting to put calendars together. So now maybe when they are manipulating the, the tribe, they, they would use those calendars, you know, like uh, I've said in one video, um, maybe it's not, oh, it's your birthday day today, or it's the son's birthday day today. We're, it, we're changing it slightly. It's uh, everybody kill the current chief day and make me chief day, you know, through these subtle manipulations. So I think, I think, you know, look, we've always been corrupt. We've always been corruptible. It's always been very difficult to, to stamp on that dragon that is our yeah. hormones that drives us around. So I don't, I don't think the corruption in, in religion today is anything new. I, I, I mean, how many stories of dark shamans do you hear that, are, you know, using that same religious corruption? I don't mean to say that it's new, but it is um, empowered by the state, you know, yeah. and by cultural apparatus, right? Whereas, yeah. like, in an ancient tribal so society, you know, if, if people started trying to control you, uh, a strong man in a strong <laughs> woman could just take the fuck off. Go yeah. start their own community. Now you're all right, Snappy. What yeah, have you told me about the YouTube <laughs> algorithm? Right. Yeah. Got to be careful. But you know what? Like you hear all these stories where people could just, you know, they could leave. They could go and, yeah. and create their own communities. They, you know, people weren't bound in the same way, but through technology and through community, like there's a lot of good, but there's also a lot of negativity. I, I, I think, think there's a lot, go ahead. a lot more, uh, uh, I think there's a lot more opportunity for that statecraft and that magic that I was talking about right yeah. at the beginning that, you know, with, Society's got so large that everything's a confusion. With there's, there's so much, in, with we got too much information now. We don't know where to pick it from. We don't know who to trust. All, all the old sources, if they weren't corrupt before, are certainly corrupt now. You know, and you've got no, to go and find out yourself. And it, you know, as you know, look, just studying this stuff. I know I'll, I'll be studying it for the rest of my life and still not know a third of what is out there to know. And for any individual person to, to have to try and fathom what the hell's going on while raising children, keeping a job, keeping society, it's not going to happen. So I, I think as technology's increased, we've put ourselves more at risk. Hey, look, it's it's Lucifer with his, with his apple there, isn't it? Look, you can take the apple and your eyes will be opened, but there are consequences to pay for it. You know, right? You lose that security. You know, there's something to be said, right? The, the you know, golden age of things. Saturn ends. Sorry to interject, but the golden age of Saturn then ends. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you you're no longer a part of nature. You're removed from nature. You can't have that equality. You now are, you know. And also, I think like so much of our society is based upon fear, and our society is designed to institute and to, and to control, right? Like. People are always on the seat of bankruptcy and you have to work constantly just to pay your rent. And it's like, this is where 99% of people are at. It's, it's, I can't blame them when they freak out. And then they're fed garbage by people who are, who are basically empowered for this whole point of making them more angry. And but it, it sounds to me like they're using Saturnian magic though, you know, food, your limitations, your, 
you sleep, even like you sleep, your fear, you know, all these things that are related to Saturn are being used against you through yeah. Mercury. <laughs> Well, we got to remember, right? Saturn has been castrated and brought low. He's no longer the ruler of the earth. The current Deus, the ruler of the earth, is Zeus. It's this technological Apollonian patriarchal force. It's it's right. It's and it's that's these kind of insight, Snappy. That is the reason why I wanted to come and speak to you. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, like. We have to be careful of things like fear. We can't allow fear to dictate us and we have to be willing to walk out into the into the unknown, you know? I often like when I first started to get into the Saturnian stuff, I I had this one, you know, I, I had this perception of Saturn, not like a vision but like as a deep um meditative understanding where Saturn is this figure who stands behind you with the knife and says, "You walk forward into the unknown mist." or i or you're destroyed it's that natural element of adapt or die you know and when we're faced with this a lot of people they just panic and they wait for that inevitable end you know or they get lied to by someone who tells them like oh you know i can tell you what you're all, what you're facing and if you just follow me i can make things more easy but does this not make you think though that the point in life is therefore growing a soul you know yeah. that the the all these you know it's like abraxas stroke saturn you know these these limitations these right you're born okay get on with it you're going to get a flu by the end of this year you'll have a disease that makes your arm fall off you'll fall in love twice but uh you know they'll end, end horribly and you've just you've got to do it I don't want to breathe today. No, you've got to breathe today. Yeah. And see see what happens if you don't. And and it's this it's that whip by which Abraxas drives us all. You must do this because you're alive. I yep. can't be bothered digesting food today. Yeah, try that. See how far it gets you. You, you have know? to be constantly in that, you know, only thing that is truly real is the flux. It's that transformative power. And you have to embrace this change and be constantly challenging and adapting yourself ever learning ever going forward and you got to embrace the uncertainty this is something that a lot of people you know we're, we're we're faced with the absurdity of life the fact that we in our current state cannot fully comprehend the truth and you and i we go i admit it i'm never going to know but i'm going to try to know as much as i can but a lot of people rather than admit the absurdity of life the fact that they can't fully grasp it they they fall for a lie or they they cling on to something they 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 lie to themselves rather they get than very serious the snappy they they get very serious that's what they do they take it all very yeah. very seriously right and they I, stop laughing yeah and I, and i just think to myself you do you do re i know that you're scared like that because you're fearing death ultimately but you know you're gonna die don't you you know that doesn't matter what you do you will die so it's the whole thing's absurd have fun with it love try and create things and grow your soul yeah right that's i mean when, when we get to the deep philosophy all of the philo all of the really truly great philosophers that's what they tell you you know you got to learn to just laugh laugh at the absurdity of life and continue <laughs> continue just embrace it and embrace death you know it's going to come yeah, yeah. but even our science, everything reveals to us that nothing is created nor destroyed. We've always existed. We always mm. will exist. You know, just because we can't remember what we were before we were living doesn't mean that we weren't there. And that doesn't mean, like, we, we can't right now fully imagine what we'll be after we die. That doesn't mean we won't be. We always no. are, you know? It, we are it. Yeah. How can we be separated from it? This. So when we're gone, we'll still be it. We'll just be different. Probably. Maybe. I don't know. So we don't know. My head a bit of a mess, so let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing. People don't want to admit that they don't. This is why, you know, Socrates, or, yeah, Socrates is considered. Socrates. Right? The gadfly. The smartest man who ever lived. Because he admitted that he didn't know shit. <laughs> and he laughed. Yeah. Right? And he challenged anyone who claimed to know anything. You know, because we've got to admit to ourselves that the absolute truth, full understanding is denied to us. 
what we can achieve is wisdom. You know, yeah. we can't achieve knowledge as, as such, right? And we have to learn to to just to, to cope with reality and to try to make the best of it. And we got to abandon these ideas of greed and material and and, 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 and creating and building up these piles of shit because anything yeah. you build up, it's just going to turn to shit anyway. You're well, just going to go old and die. <laughs> I, I see most people go to work, work themselves to the bone, and then they, they come home and they'll get on Amazon or whatever else, and, and then they buy things that they don't need. Right. And then they got a house full of stuff that they don't need and a job that they don't need because they don't need the, the house full of stuff. And it, there's just the miracle of life and that, that mystery that we spoke about at the beginning is missing. I mean, what's this? Uh, what are you? What's that there? What is it actually, though? What the hell is it doing here? I nearly swore snappy, but I didn't. What? what, what? You think that's wood? No, don't be. There's no such thing as wood. There's a word we've given to a, a, a metaphorical arrangement of things that conforms to a basic idea. That's right. it. There's nothing and they're else. Just that. They're just ideas. They're just they're just placeholders that your brain makes up in order for you to survive. <laughs> right? Yeah, There's nothing to make any sense of it at all. Yeah, exactly. and it's a nonsense. And is that not wonderful and amazing and what is going on? But they don't care. They, they've not even woken up to it. And it can be very, as with, if we're going to talk about tarot again, as with the hermit, it can be very lonely at the top. And you need to take yourself away from it. However, don't take yourself so far away that you feel apart from it. Because I think that's dangerous as well. You know, oh, I'm enlightened. I'm enlightened. Well, if you're enlightened and looking down on people, there's still there's still a good pinch of ego left there, isn't there? So we've we've got to be careful, and not judgmental, and not be pity. Not don't pity them either, you know. No, just because they're not as wise as you, it's it's just don't judge. Just get on with it. Is my my opinion on this? Right, you got to go out and live. Like we, you, you know, I don't I don't think anyone should become a monk, a monastic. You know, that's not the as much as I'm saying. You know, pursuing this life of the material. Is, is 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 not worth it you also shouldn't be giving up materialism entirely to go live in a cave and and to what deny yourself everything it, it's just as stupid you know and there's yeah. nothing to be gained you're going to destroy your life for what point you know you have and, to and the help you could that. be to other people right you know we're, we're not much without our connect you know if there's no connection between you and the other sentient creatures here what's the point we're individuals right? in a collective a major wake up call for me was recognizing that it was important that I that I start to speak about this stuff. It was important that I engage with other people, that I try to share my unique perspective, not to tell anyone anything, but just to engage in the conversation, to learn from others and to encourage other people to learn, to be a part of that communication and to attempt to try and understand as much as I can, to gain wisdom and to persist in life and to affirm life, and to enjoy life, you know, and to, mm. to take myself out of the rat race. Like for so long, I was obsessed with this idea. I had to become a monastic. I had to be a priest. I had to be, you know, this perfected person. And that was such a, a waste of time, you know, but then that doesn't mean I'm also want to go back into the full, you know, world either, you no. know, uh, the, the real, you know, I have a lot of problems with Gurdjieff, but Gurdjieff, I think, was also onto some things. He talks about the fifth way or the, the yep. way of the sly man, mm -hmm. you know, the person who learns to just walk through life and laugh, you know, to just to and take everything in stride to 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 embrace love and to embrace mysticism. And that's I what we're I getting there, though, Snappy. Hmm? I mean, we're here now, aren't we? Exactly. And I've, I've seen the work you do. Uh, you've seen some of my work. We're, we're on. The, we're certainly on the path. Exactly, and, and that's the only place I ever wanted to be. Right. You have to try, and it doesn't matter. No one knows. Right. For so long, I was worried about authority, but there is no authority. <laughs> you know, there is none. There are people who may know a lot about something, like Ammon surely knows the Greek, but you know, I would never like. One of the things Ammon got me to read is this amazing book by Cicero called On the Nature of the Gods. 
And the first thing that Cicero says in the opening chapter of that book is don't trust your teachers because, you know, you got to trust in your own faculty of reason. Otherwise, you're, you're giving up your will to someone else. And mm -hmm. they, they, they could be wrong, you know? You well, could I've, be wrong I've, too. I've, I've had that many times happen to me. Uh, bad teachers. I mean, like I said, I went to a religious school. So yeah. as far as I'm concerned now, all of them were silly, at least, if not totally wrong in a lot of the things that they did and a lot of the things that were taught to me. Martial arts, again, I've had many teachers that, especially when I was a young man, that, that were just egotistical men, that they had a bit of muscle, they'd seen a couple of Bruce Lee films, and then, you know, they thought they knew what they were talking about. And I'm learning things that will get me in trouble if I go and use them in a tricky situation. So I think um, I think the first thing your teacher should be teaching you is that I'm a human being. I'm, ve I'm very flawed. And anybody that claims to know the absolute truth should be dismissed straight, straight away. I'm just on that premise. <laughs> no, 100%. 100%. But I want to talk to you, though, about this tarot, because this has become such a central theme for you, and you are working on your own deck. So... Why don't you talk about your relation to the tarot and what do you, what do you like, you know, a lot of people utilize the tarot for fortune telling other mm -hmm. people use it like Crowley for that great work. What is your perspective on the tarot and how, and how are you utilizing it? Uh, I've certainly used it for the fortune telling, you know, psychology aspect of it. Uh, mostly for the people and mostly as, as a, an exercise. Although I do appreciate there are like, um, you know, the mathematics of 78 factorial, which is like 78 times 77 times 76 times, which is the probability that you'll get cards in any kind of sequence repeating in, in a tarot deck, are literally more particles than the entire universe contains. Literally more particles. I think it's seven universes uh, of the universe we know. Would That is how big the number is. of well, what You know what I mean. But um, how did I come to tarot? Yeah, that trip that I had, and I was yeah, I was told if, if you want to learn the mysteries, your passcode, Ryan, is th those tarot cards. So that's what I did. And as as I'm pulling them apart, learning the history, and um, you know, so many things have been written on the tarot, but it would be more true to say so many things have been rewritten on the tarot from what other people have written before and the understandings that they've had. And of course, in the age of the internet, we can cross-reference and look at the entire tradition in a way that's been almost impossible at any other point in history, unless perhaps you had John Dee's library or something like that. Right. So um, I have that advantage. I also have the advantage of, unlike most proper tarot creators and not angel cards or whatever, is that most of them, Crowley, Arthur Edward Way, used artists to paint what was in their head now i am an artist so i can paint what's in my head so i have that advantage also right. there are okay I'll, t I'll, t I'll tell you another little uh, mystical story so i i first made these cards 10 years ago and i'm just actually finishing them off now because my life totally changed that 10 years ago um they were very nearly done but not quite and I was walking from my mother's house back home on a very nice day. I've been working on the uh, Hanged Man card. And anybody who knows the tarot will know that most of the cards are related to the stars and constellations. For example, the Strength card is related to Leo with a little bit of Virgo thrown in there as well. But not the Hanged Man. No, they assign that to water because... Um, Crawley and the Golden Dawn and those guys had a bit of a fetish with uh, with Hebrew and Kabbalah, which doesn't really seem to line up, certainly not as far as the Hebrew letters go. So I was like, surely there's some constellation going on here with this uh, with this hanged man card. So it's about an eight mile walk from my mother's back to my house. And I'm, I'm passing over a canal. And there are there are swans on on the canal, and there's a, a canal barge coming up the canal very quickly, and I'm seeing these little baby cygnets and daddy swan and mummy swan. And mummy swan's a leg, and it's resting on the back. 
I'm like, oh no, Mummy Swan, and then this this canal barge is is hurtling down the canal. I'm like they they they're not going to get out of the way in time. And just as as the incident was going to happen, the canal barge went under the bridge that I was on, and didn't quite hit these these signets and swans. But then I realised on the other side, the swans knew they weren't going to get hurt by the canal barge. They hit the wake of the bow, and just sailed off like they were surfing. And as I'm walking away, I'm like, that was a very dramatically charged incident for such, such a simple little thing that happened. Like, what, what's, what was all that about? And I'm thinking, has this got something to do with the tarot cards? And I'm like, I wonder, I didn't know much about the constellations back then. I wonder if there's a, a constellation of the swan. So I looked it up and uh, Cygnus is a swan diving into the water. Of the, the Milky Way was seen like, a, like the water and there's a dark rift around that area. And Cygnus is dipping his head in, into that area. Now, Orpheus was said to be, have become uh, Cygnus, the swan, at the end of his life. Right. Anyway. Yeah, he gets ripped apart for touching boys. <laughs> yeah. You mm, like a bit of that. Um, so, what is the story of the swan? Well, it kind of survives in The Ugly Duckling. It's the metamorphosis from the ugly little dude, that, you know, is scruffy and you know, grey and not very attractive and got a weird quack for a duck, suddenly becomes this beautiful, graceful swan that sticks its head under the water with its foot rested on its back when it's tired. Now, if you know the hangman, you know his foot rests at an angle. And that when I started to look at the um, the, the hangman cards, I realised on some of them he's sticking his tongue out and it's a beak. And that he's... he's, he's Hers coming up like is upside down, obviously. His hair's coming up like this, which was feathers. And I realized that the hands tied behind his back wouldn't work because his fingers are popping up from behind here. But I also noticed they were feathers as well. And when I put it on Facebook saying, I had this strange experience today that turned out to be the answer to what star system this card is. Somebody said to me, oh, do you do know that when swans rest, rest being a big deal in the hangman card, when swans rest, they put the foot on the back. I was like, wow. oh. it just it just all made complete and just from the strange incidents with a with a with a barge. So what is tarot to me? Uh it is a condensation of the ancient mysteries. Simple. You can do the fortune teller thing if you want to. Fine. I kind of like doing it, but it's more like a parlor thing and, and a community thing for me and you know, a little psychological evaluation thing. Although they are very creepy, not creepy, but um very spooky, aren't they? I remember one time um, I was in, uh, I was near Stonehenge with a lot of like very hippie types and I was really getting on with them. We we're all having me a stereo on that and a few drinks. And um, I just happened to mention that I'd been making, I'd been making this tarot deck and I'd had my first deck printed like a prototype deck. And they're like, oh, please do the tarot for us. First guy. I've, I don't remember what the spread was, but I said, it, I said it, it's like, you know, you've had cancer or something and you've gotten over it by your own willpower and sorting yourself out and not listening to the doctors. This guy was in his early 20s, a year before he'd gone through that very same process. And I've had, I've had a lot of things like that happen, as I'm sure you have as well. Oh, yeah. No, I think you're so on point with the tarot, right? It, to me, it's the representation, like you said, of the unfolding of creation. And it accounts mm -hmm. for, for the totality of the universe and uh, yeah you can see all of that stuff like the bring up your your cards here let's start back because you're making your own deck so this is your own art that you've created yourself eh? yeah this first one i mean i put it together but um that tarot is from eliphas levi's rendition and as i've understood it that is that is where you're drawing tarot the word tarot from ultimately it's got gematria in it as well which is absolutely linked to this Saturn square that you can see on the right, right. It's, it's, which says that Saturn, the sower, um, holds the works of the wheels, which is all, you know, the wheels of the stars going around your head. And that when you decode all the gematria in here, they're giving you numbers like 108, 432, 216, you know, 72, the, these numbers and, and, uh, they're absolutely encoded in the tarot. They are the absolute, apart from the Pythagorean number symbolism philosophy that that's, generates the cards themselves, 
the actual big secret in there is the same big secret as the Masons have, the ba same big secret, secret the Templars brought back. That is from a Templar pillar that I found. Um, when you do you up the Codney, oh, it's all the pole star and the 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 long cycle great year calendar and, and 432, 1080, all these amazing numbers. The secret science, as I have called my channel. Right. It's all of these unfolding of these squares, right? And uh, like the Ogdoad. We, when we look at the tarot, you can you can see the entire unfolding of the universe through the through the number symbolism. And it's yep. it's incredible, you know, and it's also like one thing that I always like looking to at the tarot, a lot of people, when they go into the history, they find that tarot originates as a gambling game, you know. But I think in my perspective, that makes it even more profound because when we look at a lot of the temples, the rolling of the dice and these kind of unfolding of these games, it's the lots, right? The lots, it's all about this telling of the future and this exploration of the unfolding of creation, you know, mm. and it, it's all interrelated. So, of course, tarot is a game, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, although I, th I think it quickly became a game, in, in my opinion, when you look at the, the Visconti Svalza deck, for example, the oldest deck that we know of, mm. that's hand-painted beautifully and gilded. You want to play right. Snap with old Snappy? I, I wouldn't do that, would you? No. You know, so I, I, I feel that the, those original Mamluk cards that, that were the basis of the, the deck itself, they're infused with platonic number ideas you know what i mean those four elements are there straight away oh that's is it empedocles the four elements yeah yeah uh, well they're, they're older than empedocles anyway that I, I think he's just profaned those basically you can see sacred fires and sacred water going all the way back to the stone age really can't you but it's um, like when i look at the anthropology of a lot of these religions you'll see this playing and gambling of games constantly like in the biblical tradition for example uh, this has been corrupted, but when you read in the Greek, what Jesus is doing is he's stopping them gambling, right? He's not overturning money lenders, right? It's he's stopping the sacred gambling that was happening in the temple, right? Sacred and this is gambling. You, sacred gambling. This is something you see even in the uh, Sumerian, and you see this in a lot of, um, like in North America, a lot of the indigenous traditions. They have these sacred games and these games of chance, you know. Um, because they believed, especially within the Jewish tradition, that there was no randomness, right? God is, is, is control of everything. So the way you define the future or you define the word of God is through the casting of stones. Like the Uman and Thurman are dice, you know, and they would be inscribed with these letters upon them. So I see the tarot as kind of emerging of these different types of games into one kind of system. And, mm. and also the incorporation of icons. You know, the icon tradition originates in Greece and Turkey, you know, and it's this taking of the image, these divine images, and you perceive those divine images, they take you to that mystical, mythical, yeah. metaphorical form, you know, Talismans. exactly. So you take that and you combine it with lots, basically, mm. Mm. and that's how you get in the tarot. And then they're there incorporating in this unfolding of the creation through the, through the Pythagorean number system. With, with anything like this, I always have a problem when people say it's just a. Yeah. That's it. That's my only problem. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Divination. Yes. Again. Yes. Flashcards for the mysteries. Right. All of the above and more. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. And more. And more. No, you're, you're, um, you're so right. So, I mean, I, I, thinking about it, I would love to come back and give you guys a presentation on, on all the deeper, deeper stuff that's a little complicated and involves a little geometry, uh, including most people don't realize, but there's uh, all the old tarot are drawn by a pattern, you know, like a template, a geometric pattern based on seven. And, and and the real, real tarot by the people who really knew what they were doing, they used this template, which also defines the size of the earth, the size of the moon, has Pythag Pythagorean triangles all over it. It's, it's the whole deal. It's like the deeper, more mathematical scientific mysteries are in there as well, as well as all the drugs and stuff like that. Right. It's like um, 
when you like a lot of people miss the number symbolism one of the ones that sticks sticks out to me a lot is this number 666 mm -hmm. which if you look at it from the from the pythagorean understanding it is pascal's triangle and it is this you'll see 666 appears as the triangle coming down in the diamond so it's the literal drawing down of the sun of the of the star of that magic into the earth you know <laughs> and i'd also like to add that six times six times six is two one six which is half of four three two these harmonic musical numbers which takes me back to the the whole reason i got into this stuff is because i had a a deep feeling that the universe was based on sound somehow right. and now we're back to the harmonics yeah so th this this for me and i would love to in the future give you a presentation on this um is the deeper mystery of the tarot however before that i, I i've recently come to see uh, after studying mithraism for the book that i've been writing um the 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 book that i've been writing is on this square this Satur the saturnian square um but it comes from mithraism and i note from reading the pgm the greco papyri magica um that there are a lot of things in that in the mithraic liturgy that link up with the last few cards of the tarot particularly particularly so that's interesting. In fact, should we jump to one now? We can talk about that a little tiny bit. So yeah, if so you just if you if you nudge it on a couple more for me, if you don't mind. Which one? one? Uh well it's not they're not named, are they? <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, one more. There we go. Right. So in the myth I've sorry, I've not prepared this in my head. It's just something that's been going on. So excuse me if I stumble over my words and sound a bit daft. But um so in the PGM. And Carl Jung discussed this as well. That there's there's a part in there where it says um, you, you've got quite quite towards the end of, of the liturgy, and this liturgy is clearly uh, a guided drug trip, basically. But you get to a point where you look towards the sun, and if you look east and west quickly, this tube comes out of the sun, and you go to the back of the sun, and that's that's your portal. Wow. Before then, you've gone through the moon and the sun and a few other things. And, you know, we're, we're, you, you start, you become a star, you go through the moon and you go through the sun through this portal. Now, the last few cards have been the star, the moon, the sun. This one being judgment. Unfinished, by the way, to anybody looking. Something else I note about this card, now, now I'm looking at it, that, um, that I put in there from a long time ago was one of my own deeper understandings was that if we look towards the bottom of that card where the land is you might notice inverted is the nile delta can you just about see that yeah well, yeah so take my word for it at home if you can't see that the nile delta's there now if you look at the last card of the visconti deck you stare at the nile delta for a few seconds and then look at the look at the last card of the original tarot deck you'll see that those two things match up that one is a planned view of the other. When I looked into it further, it looked also like that the judgment card was to do with the Orion Nebula, which is Orion's penis, remembering that the card 21 is also the fool. You know, there's a thing where it's card zero and card 21. Yeah. The fool is Orion. The fool is Orion. So it's natural now that would end up at his, uh, at his phallus. Now, Orion on many of the cards has his trousers ripped and his willy hanging out. So here we are at his willy. Now, if you look at the, you can probably find this online, um, other people have noticed too, that the Orion Nebula looks very much like an archetypal version of the Nile Delta. The Nile Delta was drawn by the Egyptians, as was uh, the Sea of Galilee to the, to the Hebrews, as the brain and spine. It is the brain and spine system. So now we've got a link between, a very mystical link between the Orion Nebula, this card, the Mithras Liturgy, the Nile Delta, and the brain and the spine. There's, there's, there's something going on there. Now, that wouldn't be in the presentation, but... Um, That's wild. That is wild, isn't it? No, and I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll send you an email personally. I mean, you can if you can get it to anybody on the Discord or anything, you're welcome to do it there. But I, I'll show you some of my working out and actual mapping over of one of the other. And you go, oh, my word, is actually there's actually something to this. I'm not saying I'm right because Socrates is sat behind me, but, you know. It's... No, we, we definitely got to break this down further and discuss more. I should introduce you to my friend, Rich, who's been really Don't... trying to map. So we've been engaged in this project recently where we're going through and we're looking at all of the deities and, and how they manifest each other, who's having sex with who and giving birth to who. And then we're mapping that upon the tarot and across the astrology. And it seems because like the sex is the key to the magic and the unfolding of all of this. And it understand, it, it gets you through the fractals so that you can understand and reach back to, because the yeah. goal is to go back to zero. You go to 22 and then you go to zero. Yeah, again. Go back around again. Yeah. Right? I mean, if I'd have given you card zero, uh, you'd see that it's me smiling like this. <laughs> because I appreciate that I'm the Phil. And, and, and I actually feel a great association with the Phil card because I am something of a, a silly person. I love it. It's that. like the wisdom of the silly person, isn't it? What, when, I th I th you hear a lot of the time, he's a wise fool. The wisdom and foolishness are the same word. In fact, I believe there are some parts of, of, of the world where you are called a fool if you are wise. He's a fool. Yeah. No, for sure. And there's there's so much to that, right? Because the, the fool is the one who takes the leap into creation, right? He takes that that jump into the unknown and doesn't question doesn't assume knowledge, right? It's that pure Dionysian energy. He laughs and just he goes. The, how many grams of mushrooms did you have, Snappy? How many <laughs> grams was it? 14 grams. Just is, absolutely there, absolutely. is that <laughs> looking at his flower, <laughs> stepping up onto crocodiles? Yes, you know, 14 it, grams. Yeah, it was ridiculous. But, you know. Did, 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 was it after Terence McKenna had died? <laughs> it was after Terence McKenna had died. Did, yeah. did you meet him? <laughs> no, no, I didn't meet him. I had my myself completely wrecked for eight hours, ripped apart, and I couldn't grasp onto anything. But wow. I, I see it now as this, it was a deeply traumatic experience. I, like After I did that, you know, as I'm coming down, I purged, right? I started getting extremely sick. And then I was looking in the, into the vomit and I had this recognition of myself as the vomit, you know? Mm. And I saw like this incredible life coming out of the refuse. And it was so, such a profound thing for me. Like, I can't, what, what? it's so little. It's, Sorry, it's so Snappy. I, I can't help but keep noticing Saturn and the cycle and the death and the birth yeah. and the alpha and the omega and everything that we've spoken about tonight. It's, it, yeah. it, it's just there everywhere. As soon as you're alive, you know, you can say to, to much of an extent, you're not going to find Mars without Venus. They're always right next to each other, but Saturn's everywhere all the time. I love it. Yeah. No, Saturn is the key to all of this, right? Because they're the unfolding of time, right? And we're bound by time. And what the mystery is about is about a, it's not about escaping time. It's about overcoming time. It's about mm. achieving ion. This is something that Ammon talks it's about. Ion, yeah. Like a lot of people are looking for immortality. It's not immortality in the sense of the Christian sense, which is a stopping of time and existing in this paradise. No, it's about this force of will that persists through the destruction, right? It's that foundation, that museum that survives the the death that's inevitable right we're it, all going to die but it's about it's in the tarot as the lion the bull the eagle and the man the sphinx the past the present the future all four seasons brought into one and there's actually a further secret to that that uh when you count up the the numbers that the lion the bull the eagle and the man are in, in the order of the tarot that you you get 26 which is the same as jehovah yod hey vav hey which is the long count calendar again that 25,920 years, 26,000 years, that is, to so many magicians and so many of these secret societies, that's the big secret. I've not found anything deeper than that. I mean, who is the fingerprint of, of God, it, it, as they phrase it, you know? The, this right. number harmonic stuff. Right. It's, it's, yeah, and sorry, go on. 
you go ahead. I was and, just sorry, say, and you can't forget either that, um, as as you guys have, have brought up, that uh, that that Sphinx is a strangler and asks you questions about life. And why is it a strangler? Because it'll get you with its ball string, with its toxon string, because it's toxicology. And you're getting off your head and going beyond space and time. And and perhaps going receiving some prophecy or, or however your culture sees it at the time, you know you become a sibyl. Yeah, you you get to, you you see the future and you perceive like all of this has happened before and will happen again. It's that, like Nietzsche talks about this. It's that ever recurrence, you know, that 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 the constant cycles again and again and again. In the Hindu tradition, they call this the great leela, the unfolding, the play. Right, it's it's God having fun with itself again and mm. again and again and again. Mm -hmm. One becomes many, so that it can know itself, so that it can have sex with itself, you know. And then it becomes one again because of that separation, right? Because this it's is that tired grand and paradox. Out. It's that grand paradox. In order to experience the other, in order to have knowledge and communication, you have to separate. But then yes. that separation causes suffering, and so to yes. alleviate that suffering. You return back to the one, but then you don't have knowledge and communication. You, you don't have love, so you have to separate again. <laughs> I, I would like to. I would like to then put what you just said into physics. You know, when you look at quantum physics, what's actually happened is that that quantum field that's at the bottom of everything is fluxing into reality as we know it, and then fluxing out to the vacuum. It fluxes in, takes the information, fluxes out. It wakes up. As its day goes to sleep, it spends its week working hard. It gets drunk and silly at the weekend. It, you know, goes about its daily activity. It immolates itself and has sex at night. You yeah. know, it's this constant sun, moon, sun, moon, and beyond, obviously. But as th those being the, right. the well, two polar like, priorities in the Western tradition. Like, to me, it goes back again to that, that vision I had on all those mushrooms, right? I experienced it as every breath in was, was a death and every breath out was a rebirth. Or, or at one point, it, 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 to me, it felt like, you know those games with the marbles where they hit each other and then they, yeah, they snap? Newton's Cradle. They, yeah. Newton's Cradle, it's called. Exactly. The universe is one of those things and it's all connected to the breath and the heartbeat, you know, mm. again and again and again and again. <laughs> well it, it's strange i don't know how you find it but on my most profound trip um in those downloads that you get i'm still processing some of the information in there now and it seems that everything that i've remembered has is a vital clue is a password as you as you put it is is, is a pass key to something else recently I, I remembered that um there was one point i was really struggling in, in a particular trip and no, it was, sorry, it was that same trip, actually. I, I was struggling. And I realized that to have in those states, to have a negative thought, as it were, have a bad thought or aggressive, you know, whatever you want to, you know, not, not a wholesome thought, would send me into a cascade of terrible feeling. Even to, to begin to think those kind of thoughts would cascade into something awful. So you must re restrain yourself from that. And, and although you understand why you're having those thoughts, you must try and keep it positive. Well, that's true in life, isn't it? And it's the basis of, basis of hermetics as well. You know, keep, keep, keep on top of your willpower. Don't, don't fall into the negative. It's important to have the negative. You know, you might say that thinking itself is for problem solving, which in itself is, is ne a negative thing. You know, a problem is negative. However, your mind state is so important and it's, it's just come up again recently and I'm really trying very hard. Look, it's been winter. I'm, I'm currently single. There's, there's lots of, my life's not going at its best right now. However, I've gotten those tarot done, that project I needed to pick up again. I've met you guys. I've done a, so many different things and not allowed the darkness to creep in just don't you know it's there i'm constantly fighting it but then you know there's these wonderful things too you just gotta it's that sphinx right. to know or, to dare to will to you know it makes me think of like when you were talking first about the you know that that profound image of the hermit right the hermit on one hand 
isolates themselves in order to do the shadow work, that self-reflection, to see. But what is the point of this kind of dark thinking? It is to figure out your mistakes, you know, to reflect upon your life and your limitations, to learn how to think positively, right? That is the yeah. point of the separation, right? You, yeah. you remove yourself from society so that you can truly go inward so that then you can go back outward, right? It, again, it all comes back to this pulsation as well, right? The the flux yeah. and the transformation. The hmm. yeah, you know, totally. so in these moments of isolation, right? Like we just went through COVID. That's like the most Saturnian type of energy I can imagine, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, let's not talk about COVID. Eh? Yeah. But, you know, I just mean that we're all isolated and we all yeah. are stuck and we had to... We had to do that. We had everyone was forced to take this time to do that shadow work. <laughs> that didn't get yeah. me, Snappy. I, w I wouldn't have any of it. I'm too. Uh, I'm too Dionysi, and I just went about my own thing. I, I weren't. <laughs> I didn't believe it. Uh, yeah, they weren't having me because I could see, for the simple reason that I could see they were using the magic that I was studying. You know, look, they were repeating certain things so many times. I'm like, you are literally casting a spell. You're spelling it out. For a spell of time with the words you're casting a spell on me. No, I just saw him doing magic and he's like, well, I don't trust you. You know, if a magician comes up to you dressed like a magician and says, oh, play a little game with me, you can win £5,000. You ain't coming away with that £5,000. You might be lo lost £5,000. So, right. yeah, that was the way I saw it. Anyway. I, I might have well been wrong. Thankfully, I wasn't. But there you go. You know, Enough of my rant. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? You have to learn to adapt and to protect yourself and to continue and persist regardless. Like, what are you going to do? There's always been these kind of crises. But it's interesting you bring up that image of the magician because when I think of the magician and many tarot decks, one of my favorite ones, it's an Egyptian tarot. And the magician is donkey headed, right? He's an ass because the magicians are often the charlatan. They're often the yeah. guy with the, with the, with, the magic behind the curtain, you know, the, yeah. it's, it's this duality. The one who can uh, grant you knowledge is also a liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it's the communication. If, if you've got one body and another body, and then some kind of format between the two, whatever's between that bridge between the two, there's a whole chance for corruption there. You know, this might have pure thoughts, that won't have pure thoughts, but this middleman who is Mercury, you know, he can corrupt it. He's a liar. He's, he's a transmitter. If he decides to, you know, put a bit of emotion into that that wasn't there before, he can totally change your perspective on things. What right. were we just talking about then, Snappy? I've lost my train of thought. We're, we're, we're just, we're, we're on to the magician now, you know? And this, oh, I so, I, I, if you don't mind. Um, so there's a medieval image of the magician. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the marketplace. And there's a, a, a magician doing a cup and ball trick. There's a monkey sat next to his table for the monkey mind. And then there's another guy stood behind a patron who's, who's bent over trying to figure out what's going on with this magician's tricks. And behind him, there's a pickpocket. Now, if you studied tarot long enough, you'll come to realize that one of the main humanistic characteristics or humanistic symbologies of, of the magician card is attention. Where's your attention? And and that is playing with attention is is the the main power of the magicians. All of us. I call myself a magician now, even though I was trying to defraud these swines. I, I, I am one myself now. A right. good one. It's a nice one. Well, you know what, too? It's like, what did the magician really do? The man, magician constructs a narrative. He tells a story. All stories are fundamentally lies. But... There are lies that transform and create history. They predict and they define the they predict the future and define the past. And if you look at the most powerful modern magicians, they're storytellers. There are authors, people like Grant Morrison or yeah. you know um, Alan Moore or Alan Moore. even a character like Trump, right? Because they they utilize the power of lie and falsehood and they tell stories about themselves. They reimagine. <laughs> The grand thing, like what Grant Morrison tells you flatly, what did he do? He created a comic book with himself as a superpowered non-binary mega hero who got the girl and 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 was in on top of the world. And then it his whole life played out 
like that. Uh, I'm surprised that you can tell what Grant Morrison's saying. He's so Scottish. Although, uh, being Canadian, are there a lot of like Scottish settlers in your area? Oh, there's Would tons. You know? there's tons. Yeah. We, have, um, we have two provinces that are super, super Scottish, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. If you go to Newfoundland, it's like they were mostly Scottish and Irish immigrants. And they sound like... I can barely understand them. They sound yeah. like they're from Glasgow, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right, then. What are you doing? There are yeah. we Canadians there. We never changed. They're all colonies still, you know? <laughs> Get in my belly. <laughs> but, yeah, it's all about, you know, and this is a psychology thing. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a uh, doctor of psychology of uh, neuroscience, and he was telling me that the brain operates on narrative, okay? Unless you have like a form of autism, you know, most people think entirely through the telling of stories. We learn everything through communicating of stories. We perceive the world through the communication of story. So if you control the story, if you write mm -hmm. your own story, that's real magic. That's you will dictate how people perceive you and how you perceive yourself. So I, th I think you've put the you know magicians and language the very first magician is a, on the original cards he's a scribe for that reason right. that he can change the meaning of what you've asked him to write down now well you know spelling a curse a cursor it's all language based this stuff your brain is based on symbols those symbols come together in stories a narrative well we're talking about letters words and sentences aren't we yeah. ultimately so whoever controls those things controls you if you're not awake to it because the 100%. you know as we said earlier there's so much going on in the human frame that it's difficult to keep a track of it and these things are higher thoughts you know this is the higher stuff it's the more difficult you know i don't think i've ever done anything better with my life than learn the tarot and i i, I have qualifications in physics it doesn't compare physics was way easier than tarot because, like I'm on, it's, it's forcing you to extract that information from it. And it's not really, to, it's kind of say, if you've got the eyes to see, if you've got the ears to hear, it's like my ears are all full of gun cam and just tell me, mate. Just right. tell me. <laughs> I don't have to wait for Dumin, Dion and Snappy to start talking about it on Sunday. But there's How also is Dion anyway? Dion is wonderful. He's doing great. He's... Um... His big thing is uh, he work. He lives in uh, California, in, in Los Angeles, and he works. He was working in Hollywood, but the strike had uh, put things on hold for him, and he wound up having to get a job um, growing marijuana. And it wasn't really wasn't it? He on one hand you'd think it would be great, but the kind of people who are who are doing business in marijuana were not the kind of people he wanted to be working with. But right. the strike in Hollywood is over, and now he's able to get back to his work. He works as a security guard, but he loves the job because he can be free to do what. It, basically, he gets to hang out around sets, and he can be on his phone researching. And we yeah, just cool. we, we, when he was working, we would just be chatting all day. You know, <laughs> how did you meet Dion? Just I'm this card or whatever. All of this, all of this stuff came through. What ended up happening was uh, I go on to Neil's stream, like Neil Gnostic informant. And he mm -hmm. was talking to um, this guy, Ariel, and he was talking to Ammon. And then they had a link on that stream to a Discord server, which was the Myth and Lore server. Mm -hmm. And I went on to the Myth and Lore server, and that was started by a friend of, our, a friend of ours now, this guy, uh, Perot. And right. uh, when I went on to that Discord, Dion was there. <laughs> he, was, he had found the same link. And uh, we just started chatting. And uh, Dion and I, like, I recognized in Dion someone who had the same kind of deep pursuit of this kind yeah. of interesting religious study. And he yeah. was far more interested in the conspiracy and stuff, mm -hmm. which I had like a deep, like, black hole. Like, I did something that I had never really engaged in, but was interested in. So I would pepper him with all these kinds of questions. And what ended up happening on the Discord is we would have these chats and people would just join in and want to listen. And then we were like, sure. we should just turn this into a YouTube show where you did. <laughs> I, I was like, hey, Dion, tell me about this. And that's how Occult Explorers was born. <laughs> so who sent the African chief to my uh, mysterious dream there? 
to tell me I, where you are. So I, maybe he knows Ammon. <laughs> it's it could be Ammon, but I almost think it's Dion. You know, uh, Dion is one of the most interesting and amazing people I've ever met. He actually went to Africa. He spent mm. a couple years in there well he also we connected as drummers he's he was a professional drummer yeah, yeah. Years. and he hooked up with these african drummers who said come with us back to the continent and then while there he started getting initiated into all these different mystery type stuff and eventually it even led him to south america where he became an ayahuasca lero in the santo daimi uh, and he did that for years but that's a dangerous job administering mm. ayahuasca to people because well my know. um I my I'll not say a name, but my ex was doing that as a kind of I called her an ayahuasca priestess. And you mm. can imagine how uh, how dodgy that is in the UK. Right? Very yeah. And especially dodgy in the US, right? You know, mm -hmm. people are I mean, California is a lot more open, but the cops are never open about anything. No. And people tend to have intense reactions, you know. And so I don't know the full story, but Dion had some bad experiences with where people did not take well to the ayahuasca. And he right. just thought, you know what? Not worth it. It's not worth yeah, it. Yeah, my, 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 my ex would do full medical, you know, cross-checking every medication they were on. She did a lot of work beforehand just to make sure everybody was safe. She did a good job, although it turned out she was a terrible person oh. to me. No, I'm joking. She's perfectly no. lovely. I just you know, can't stand relationships <laughs> tend to bring that out of each other, right? <laughs> you wind up yeah. like, gosh, I'm only joking. Each other's shadow. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was over COVID as well, so you know you can get too close, can't you? Exactly. Right. And those are those those like, I mean, I see the COVID as a deep Saturnia moment where people were challenged. Yeah. You're forced that, to confront myself. Up. Here we go. You've, you've you got know? to go apart and come together and go apart and come together because just doing yeah. that don't work. As, no. as I'm sure you're discovering with your transgenderism or whatever we're yeah. calling it. Yeah. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your, your, your foray in, into, into the absolute feminine. Yeah. It's about, you know, exploring the self. And for me, it was recognizing that for so much of my life, I had denied aspects of myself. And because either society beat that out of me quite literally growing up, you know, mm -hmm. what it's like to grow up as a, as a masculine person, especially in our culture, in our age, you know, it's, uh, it's brutal. And especially if you're an effeminate person, you I know, was, uh, especially growing up, I was effeminate bullied all the time. I had a, ter I had a terrible time of it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I know I did behave. Yeah. You know, so I experienced that. And then on top of that, I had this deep self-loathing that was instilled in me because of, my foray into Christianity. And mm. I did a lot of it to myself. You know, I got heavily invested in that mysticism. I read all the Bible and, you know, I, I thought I had to self-deny. I thought I had to be self-critical and self-hate. So, so, sorry, just, just to investigate, what were the, were the feelings? Um, obviously, it's very difficult to dance around language, Snappy. So if I say something foolish, no. just know that my heart's good. Um, were they gay? Were they homosexual feelings, or were they woman feelings? Although I can see where they cross over because of men. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For me, for me, it's a bit of both. Um, I would describe myself as bisexual and, and trans. Um, and I'm You're just I would greedy, say, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> You're just greedy. You just want it all, all I of everything. All. I see myself <laughs> as like a trans femme, so. Um, I don't fully identify completely as woman, but I'm on that feminine spectrum yeah. and I'm yeah. pursuing that. And for me, it's a very much a, a spiritual calling, a, a, you know, it's, it's so connected to this pursuit of the mystery. And it's about this, um, you know, I, I see myself in many ways on the same path as Addis, right? As yeah. that imitation of the divine feminine. And that, that image has played such a central role in my life. And uh, for me, it's about learning to embrace the self and then experience also this, this unfolding, this otherness, and learning to, to, to transform, to become something mm. greater, right? Are you finding, uh, as, as uh, a boy, as a man won't necessarily become a man, you know, it takes effort and sacrifice and all those other things, so something I've never quite worked out, but... Um, 
are you finding there's a similar thing on your journey towards femininity? Yes. Are you having to work at it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, a lot of it was, has been learning to just let go of self hangups. You know, I was, you know, I used to talk very different, you know, when I was younger, I used to, 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 to have different mannerisms and it's now a returning to those kind of, to that kind of being in many right. ways. And it's also an exploration to a certain extent about, you know, you know, femininity, it's, it's like masculinity. People want to reduce these ideas to certain things, to certain mm. practices and yeah. practices is a, is a part of it. You know, there is this, feminine aspect of, of, of dress and of behavior, but I see it more as an approach. You know, women and feminine people tend to be about kinship building, about working with others, about, about manifesting this form of love. And she's not me. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, just, just interject that once again. I'm starting to feel like Neil, just shouting at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Neil. Uh, anyway, um, you know, oh, for, you know, busting that Neil joke, I've totally forgot what I was talking about. What, what, what was the last thing you were saying? <laughs> I said, uh, like, femininity is a lot about kinship building and connecting in relationships, yes. building love. I thought that Discord server was run by you. It is run by me, so it wasn't started. Oh, right, it is not. Okay, sorry, it wasn't started by you. Well, I just, I, I, you just appeared to me to be that person that does connect people together that does gather people right? that that feminine family you know old lady with big boobs and a big belly oh come here love you know that you know what i mean don't you big no, mama black sure. folk would call her well if i was going to describe myself as a tarot card i would say that i'm trying to manifest the queen of discs you know that's that right. energy that i'm trying to build the, the person who builds the foundation through connecting people together through bringing people together in a form of friendship and love and connection, mm. you know, and the yeah. discord and this server, the, the, the YouTube channel, that's the whole project. This is how my magic is manifesting in this kind of feminine queen of discs energy. Excellent. You know? I, I must say the reason why I connected with you in the end was um, it was Terrence McKenna again. It was <laughs> find the others, find the others. You know, right. You're the others. Yeah. Amazing. This has been so much fun, Ryan. Um, I really enjoyed having this deep conversation. We're coming on two hours now, so we should probably wind down. So what I want to ask you, is there anything you want to leave our audience with? Is there anything you want to, as a last form of discussion? I would be, I would be preaching to the converted, I think, on, on this channel. But um, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was that the world is not as you think it is as simple as that. And if you can start there and, and end it, I'll never know what it is, but it's not what I think it is. I think, I think that's something miraculous you can take away with you because it will have permanent effects on the way that you look at life. Simple as that. Other than that, Snappy, I would love to come back and give you, I mean, if you, even if it was just for you and on this channel, I'd love to give you a presentation of what I found in the tarot. We will 10,000% do that. Let's let's chat over email. I'm sure everyone here will love to see that. And I want to dig more because like, I didn't realize that you drew all these images and the stuff you're talking about. I'm, I'm very, very intrigued. You know, um, I've mostly approached the tarot through that mystical approach of engaging with the images. So I haven't done a lot of the astrological. This is something that keep that I keep engaging with and coming up to. So I'd love to, to hear your perspective and pick your brain since you've already done it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally happy to do that because I feel like I've had so much from you guys, and you know I've known about you a lot, but you haven't known about me. So, so let's uh, let's redress that balance. Let's redress that balance. All right, everyone. So, any final words before I say goodnight? <laughs> Big up your bad selves, everybody. All it's right. two o'clock in the morning, so I'm going straight to bed. There'll be no Discord or anything like that tonight. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of Asterion. There you go. Put yourself to sleep. All right, everyone. Peace, love. Hail Satan. Make sure to follow Ryan on their channel, Ryan7. You can see it here. They have some amazing documentaries. They do a podcast with a couple of their friends, and they have these longer form kind of, um, well, you do like 
deep dives like your Sator one where you actually go to the graveyard and you go check out that pillar. Really cool stuff. And you're bringing about a Netflix documentary you're mentioning in the future, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So big stuff coming for the channel. Like and subscribe with Ryan7. And uh, we'll talk to everyone soon. So have a good night. Take care, people. Peacey Weiss. <laughs>